understanding the game we're playing. This game called work, or life, or love, or whichever one you want, or all of them. In game theory, there are two kinds of games. There are finite games, and there are infinite games. A finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective, baseball. We all agree what the rules are, and at the end of nine innings, whoever has more runs, we declare the winner, and the game is over. No one ever says, wait, 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 if we can just play three more innings, I know we can come back and win. Doesn't happen, right? You have winners and you have losers, right? Then there is an infinite game. An infinite game is defined as known and unknown players. The rules are changeable, and the objective is to keep the game in play, to perpetuate the game. When you pit a finite player versus a finite player, the system is stable. Baseball is stable. When you pit an infinite player versus an infinite player, the system is also stable. The Cold War was stable because there can be no winners and losers. It doesn't exist. That's not a scenario we want. And so you keep the game in play to keep it stable. And in an infinite game, because there are no winners or losers, what happens is players drop out when they run out of the will or the resources to play and then they're replaced by other players. The game perpetuates, the players change out. Problems arise when you pit a finite player versus an infinite player, because the finite player is playing to win, and the infinite player is playing to stay in the game, and the finite player will always get uh, frustrated. They will find themselves in quagmire. This was the United States and Vietnam. We were fighting to win. They were fighting for their lives. This was the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They were fighting to beat the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen would fight for as long as was necessary. Now, let's look at the game of business. The game of business is, by its very definition, an infinite game. It has pre-existed before every single company on this planet ever existed, and it will outlast every single company on this planet. But if you listen to the words of most companies, they don't know the game they're in. You listen to companies, they want to be number one. Based on what metrics? Based on what time frame? Revenues? Market share? Square footage? Number of employees? Based on a quarter, a year? Five years, 10 years, 50 years? I didn't agree to those standards. You can't suddenly just arbitrarily say we're number one. No one else agreed to the standards. It's nonsense to beat our competition. Based on what? And they study their competition, trying to outdo their competition. And yet, I've never heard of a company that's taken down by the competitors they know. They're always taken down by the competitors they don't know. Do you think MySpace knew that Facebook existed? They were worried about Friendster. <laughs> you can't make strategic decisions from studying your competition. You can make tactical decisions from studying your competition, but not strategic decisions. But when you listen to the way most companies play the game, they're in the wrong game. That's why they get frustrated. The great organizations understand that they're playing to stay in the game. Jim Senegal, the founder of Costco, says Wall Street's in the business of making the quarter of the year. We're in the business of building a company for the next 50 years. The understanding of knowing what game you're in radically changes the kinds of decisions you make and the way you see the world. It is also tremendously confidence building. Let me give you a true story. I spoke at a education and education. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I spoke at an education summit for Microsoft. I also spoke at an education summit for Apple. At the, education for, at the Education Summit for Microsoft, I would say that 70% of the executives spent about 70% of their presentations talking about how to beat Apple. At the Apple Education Summit, 100% of the executives spent 100% of their presentations talking about how to help teachers teach and how to help students learn. One is playing this way, and one is playing that way. One is playing finite, and the other one is playing infinite. Gets which one gets frustrated. <laughs> so at the end of my talk at Microsoft, they gave me a gift. They gave me the new Zoom when it was a thing. <laughs> and let me tell you, this thing was spectacular. 
It was the most elegant piece of technology I'd ever used. The user interface was incredible. The design was spectacular. I absolutely loved it. It was easy to use, and it was bright and gorgeous and fantastic. It didn't work on iTunes, which is a different problem, so I couldn't use it, but, but it was amazing. <laughs> and elegant. My god, it was elegant. So I'm sitting in the back of a taxi with a very senior Apple executive, sort of employee number 12 kind of guy. And, you know, I like to stir pots. So I turned to him, I said, you know, Microsoft gave me their new Zoom. And it is so much better than your iPod Touch. And he turned to me and he said, I have no doubt. Conversation over. Because the infinite player understands sometimes you're ahead and sometimes you're behind. Sometimes your product is better and sometimes it's worse. The goal isn't to be the best every day. The goal isn't to, out, to outdo your competition every day. That's a finite construction. If I had said to Microsoft, I've got the new iPod Touch and it's so much better than your Zoom, they would have said, can we see it? What does it do? React, 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 react. Finite players play to, be be to beat the people around them. Infinite players play to be better than themselves. To wake up every single day and say, how can we make our company a better version of itself today than it was yesterday? How can we create a product this week that's better than the product we created last week? We also have to play the infinite game. It's not about being ranked number one. It's not about having more followers on Twitter than your friends. It's not about outdoing anyone. It's about how to outdo yourself. It's not about selling more books or getting more TED views than somebody else. It's about how to make sure that the work that you're producing is better than the work you produced before. You are your competition. And that is what ensures you stay in the game the longest. And that is what ensures you find joy. Because the joy comes not from comparison, but from advancement. The problem is, The problem is, we're human beings, and we love to compare. We, can't, we love a ranking. Oh, we love a ranking. Top 10 this, top 100 that. Oh, we love a ranking. You know? Every industry has got its own rankings, and we love to be on those rankings, even though most of the rankings are arbitrary, and you can pretty much foil most of them. You can buy your way onto most of them. Right? But I'm on the list, right? They did a study. A, who do all the studies. Um, they did a study where they asked people if they wanted a free $400,000 house on a block where all the other houses are $100,000, or a free million dollar house on a block where all the other houses are a million, uh, $4 million. Most people took the $400,000 house. We just love to be better than each other. But that is a depressing way to live a life. What I urge you to do, if you are not a millennial, is to have a little empathy for the millennials around you. They were dealt a bad hand, and unfortunately, we have to help them build their confidence, find their patience, and break the habit from their technology so that they can learn the social skills that they need to live happy, joyful lives. If you are a millennial, it's not you. <laughs> and take care of the millennial friends that you have around you because they're not mad at you and they're not bad people. They were dealt the same bad hand that you were dealt. Don't demand that they take care of you. Take care of them. And that's part of the problem. There's an entire section in the bookshop called self-help and there's no section in the bookshop called help others. And the way that we fix the problems in the world is not by trying to demand that help people help us. How can I lose 10 pounds? How can I find love? How can I find the job that of, my, of my dreams? That's what all the books say. No, it should be, how can I help my friend live a healthy lifestyle? How can I help my friend find a lifetime of fulfillment? That's what it's about. It's about service to others, because that's what it means to be human. Everything about our makeup, our biology and our anthropology is designed to get us to look after each other. Everything about our makeup is designed to get us to take care of each other. That's why an event like this feels better than watching it online. 
because we get to sit next to each other. We get to sit with each other. It's nicer for me too. It's much nicer for me to be here with you because we're social. But we all have a responsibility in this tribe. If you want to have a happy, successful, fulfilling, confident life, you have to commit yourself to take care of the people around you. That's just how it works. Good?